Good morning, class. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about beat sheets and how to figure out the beats in your um, script. Uh, what I know I've given you a lot of information on structure, on story structure and how to structure your film and things like that. And I promise you this will be the last structure lecture <laughs> that we have. But I just can't um, tell you enough how important structure is and, and planning out your script before you even write it. So um, first of all, I want to sh tell you what a beat sheet is. You guys know what beats are for stories. It's the sometimes it's the it can be considered the breath between the stories and um, so what we have here is um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about beat sheets how to craft a good one so first of all we're going to talk about what a beat sheet is so beat sheet as in the beat of each story point is a list of short bulleted descriptions about each of your scenes and the scenes in your story. So you can just do um, do it as a bullet point to start out with, and these things can be expanded into outlines. But it's just, it can be as short as you want to. It could be one sentence, one bullet point sentence, or it could be, you know, if you're a, kind of a talky writer, you can write more. I'm very verbose myself. It's tough for me to be concise, so I have to keep rewriting stuff to make it short. So if you have that problem, that's okay, because it can be as long or short as you want it to be. It could be stated that if you have 60 scenes and you could create a beat sheet with 60 entries that describes the mission, content, or both for each of these scenes. So each entry on the beat sheet describes what the scene does in the context of the story exposition, ex explains why it's there. So beat sheets, you can do a, a plotting beat sheet where you're just talking about the plot points. The action points, what goes on, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and that happens because that happens, blah, blah, blah. You can do that, which most people just do that. But you can also do a character beat sheet where you're um, processing, the, processing the arc of the character through each scene. So you can do, so the, the character learns this or does this in this scene or that scene. I'm not going to have you guys do that. Either. I'm just going to have you do a plotting beat sheet. But um, there, are, there are a couple types of beat sheets that you can do. And if, if you're getting into a big, long script, uh, feature script, then you may want to do a character beat sheet, too. So um, beat sheets can be done before or after you write your script. I encourage you to do it before so you can write from the structure you created. Um, People do it afterwards so that they can ex more easily explain the story to, story to the executives looking to buy it. I know that when you guys did your synopsis, I had you go through those questions in that synopsis breakdown sheet. I think there were nine or 12 little areas where you could where, where you ask questions and you answer those questions. You, that could be your beat sheet too. Um, just answering those questions and kind of putting the plot beats down. But um, there's a book called... Um, Save the Cat, which is a very famous screenwriting book, and it's a very good one, actually. I would encourage you guys all to get it. Blake Snyder wrote it. And, you know, when I was in film school, it's kind of like, ah, you know, Blake Snyder, uh, you know, it's just the, you know, one of your just typical screenwriting things. But now that I'm an actual screenwriter and doing the work, I can see that it's, it's an excellent book, and it's very helpful for screenwriters. I don't know why I had that attitude in film school, but um, I guess I did to all the writers. I thought, oh, they're just, you know, I don't know. But anyway, um, so what we do to create a beat sheet is, I'm gonna show you what a beat sheet is and then give you an example from a real life example. So just like I said, we had those different plot, those different plot points or the different, 19 or 19, 9 to 12 points when you guys were working out, working through your synopsis. Um, the Blake Snyder beat sheet from Save the Cat is 15 different um, segments of the story. And it's actually very good because you're breaking it down to a lot of the different setups that you're going to have when you're writing the scenes. So the opening image is something that was on the other one. Um, you need to have an open, opening image, a visual that represents the struggle and tone of the story, a snapshot of the main character's problem, 
before the adventure begins. So what I'm going to do is show you the beat sheet that was done for Toy Story 3. Um, I'm hoping you guys all saw that. I'm sure you did. You guys grew up on that um, series. So this is when Andy goes off to college, Toy Story. And the beat, the first beat, is that opening scene. And I'm going to read it, the opening image. So we are reintroduced to our favorite characters, Woody, Buzz, and friends, in the action-packed train robbery chase sequence. We're dropped into this world quickly, and it's not until after we have some fun and adventure that we quickly pull back and realize we're remembering a play episode that Andy had years ago. Then the re reveal is we're watching a VCR recording of Andy as a young child when he loved nothing more than to play with his favorite toys. This nostalgic moment seems like so long ago, and our tour character characters long for the attention they once had. That was a really great way to open up that story for us to remember what the other ones were like and to know put you in the setting of you know where we're at now with um, Andy and his toys so then the setup the second thing you do is expand on the before snapshot present the main character's world as it is and what's missing in their life so we got life normal but but what's missing there's there's got to be something that they can go go to so then for Andy what we do is the theme stated, Woody tells Buzz that they belong to Andy and that they will always be his friends. They must go to college with them and never lose this bond of loyalty and friendship that they have with their owner. Okay, so that's the theme stated. That's what they're so that's what these toys are gonna go for through this entire thing. They're gonna try to get Andy to love them and take them to college with them. So the theme stated. What, what, it's what your story is about, the message, the truth. Usually it is spoken to the main characters or in their presence, but they don't understand the truth, not until they have some personal experience and context to support it. Okay. So then the next one would be the catalyst. Now that's the moment where life as it is changes. We go from the normal life. It's the telegram, the act of catching your loved one cheating. Allowing a monster on board the ship, meeting the true love of your life, etc. The before world is no more. The change is underway. We normally, the callus, we call the inciting incident. Um, there's a bunch of different ways we can call it, but it's, it's the inciting incident, basically. So the catalyst for Toy Story is Toy Story 3. So the catalyst, oh, we didn't do the setup. Okay, the setup, we'll do the setup first. Sorry about that. Andy is now 17 and is going to college. Andy doesn't need his toys anymore. In fact, the only way our toys can grab his attention is by pretending to call him on his cell phones in hopes that he will discover them in the toy chest and play with them like old times. Andy is going to college in only a few days, and by his mother's request, he must organize all the old stuff in his room into piles. Stuff that should go into the attic, stuff that goes into storage, stuff that is no longer needed and should be tossed into the garbage, and lastly, stuff that will go to college with Andy in a few days. Our toys are panicked. Why doesn't Andy care about us anymore? Why doesn't he want to play with us anymore? Will they be tossed aside forever and forgotten? They all hope desperately to be chosen for the college pile so that they will stay part of Andy's life forever. So, so we see what the setup is. So now Andy has to decide whether he's gonna keep him or not. So we can see the theme that they want to stay with stay with them, but now Andy gets to decide whether he stays with them. So they're all in a panic. So that creates the tension. Okay, so then there's a debate because um, the catalyst pushes, the inciting incident pushes our character to change, then they have to decide whether or not they want to change with it or, or stay in the status quo. So there's a debate going on inside of them and Blake Snyder calls this the debate. He says, change is scary for a moment. A brief number of moments. The main character doubts the journey they must take. Can I face this challenge? Do I have what it takes? Should I go at all? It's the last chance for the hero to chicken out. So we'll just do these two at a time so I don't have to keep flipping back. And then the sixth one is breaking into two, which means usually there's a climax up to act two. So this is act one. The main character makes a choice and the journey begins. We leave the thesis world and enter the upside down opposite world of act two. So um, before act two, there should be a reversal. 
the first reversal. There should be at least three reversals where things are going good and then they go bad, or things are going bad and then they go good. There should be a reversal right before Act 2. So, um, so right here, breaking into two, this is where the character makes a choice to, to go on the journey, to do something different than where they were before. Okay, so for Toy Story 3, the catalyst or the inciting incident, so it says, because the toys want to be part of Andy's life forever, however, this isn't exactly the case. There's a mix-up. Andy is cleaning his room and making the various piles that his mother spoke of when he puts the majority of his toys in the pile meant for the attic. This plastic bag is then misinterpreted as junk by Andy's mother and taken outside and put by the road to be taken away by the junk man. The toys are devastated, and they think Andy's trying to get rid of them. They are convinced that they mean nothing in Andy's life, and this is the worst possible case scenario for them. However, would they see that Woody was chosen for the college pile, and he's and that he saw Andy put the toys in the attic pile, and thus he knows that Andy still cares about them. Woody must rescue his friends from the junk pile. <laughs> I'm getting choked up. Before they are taken away to the junkyard, never to be seen again. Woody to the rescue. <laughs> Woody jumps out the window, scales the house, and sees that the garbage truck is just full of... <laughs> and is taking away... I remember this movie. I think it's funny. Taking away the junk pile. He runs after the truck and tries to stop it. Panicked that his friends have been taken away, when looking over, he sees that they have escaped to the recycle bin, where they are in retreat to safety in the garbage. Okay, so then the debate. Convinced that they are no longer wanted, the toys find their way back into the minivan, into a new pile of belongings, meant for sunny day care facility. The debate is this. Woody says that Andy didn't mean to put them in the junk pile and thus still cares about them. All of the other toys don't believe this, and they think that the only way that they can continue to feel loved and played with by a child is by going to Sunnyside. Woody warns against this. We belong to Andy. We always have, and this is how it has to be. That our other toys don't listen. At least at Sunnyside, they will have someone who cares about them and who will play with them on a daily basis, unlike Andy. Dramatic question posed in this debate is, is Sunnyside a good place? Should toys turn their back on Andy and give up on the idea of going to college with them? Does Andy care about them anymore? Did he really put them in the junk pile? All these are questions that fuel and propel our second act as well as the conflict resolution in the third act. They are specific and hold both emotional and physical stakes to each of our characters. I thought they did this really well in that movie. It was so touching. Okay, so the next one, the next questions are, so B story. So they always um, want you to have a side story or another storyline kind of going on the side that um, goes along with the, the main story. So the B story, here he says it's usually the love story. If there's, a, if there's another main plot, say he's trying to save the world, the love story would be the B story. So it says, that this is when there's a discussion about the theme the nugget of truth, usually this discussion is between the main character and the love interest. So, the B story is usually called the love story. But it could be other things too. It's just the side story that supports the main story. In a, in a, a short script, you, you, a lot of times you don't have a B story. Um, you can, if, if you're very clever and can do that, that would be good. But, uh, in, in, but in a feature, it's probably good to have one. Keeps it more interesting. And then you can add complications through that. And then the promise of a premise. Um, this is when, I don't know who Craig talked, relationship with the Rihanna Blooms, when Indiana Jones tries to beat the Nazis to the Lost Ark, when the detective finds the most clues and dodges the most bullets, this is when the main character explores the new world and the audience is entertained by the premise they have been promised. So this is when the... Um, protagonist starts acting on his journey. This is when he really starts making choices and starts moving um, the narrative ahead by what he does. So we'll look at those two on Toy Story 3. So Toy Story 3, the B story. So the B story is Woody heads out on a journey to get home to Andy. And of course there are complications. He gets stuck in the bathroom. He tries to fly away via the roof and then gets caught in a tree, noticed by a little girl, Bonnie, who attends Sunnyside. She's intrigued with Woody and takes him home with her. 
Okay, they had the fun and games thing first there. Huh. Oh, the break into two. So they arrive. Okay, break into two. They arrive at Sunny Side Daycare. They put seven there. They arrive at Sunny Side Daycare despite the warnings of Woody. This is a, this place seems pretty good, right? Everybody seems nice enough. There's a lot of new toy friends, cool facilities, lots of playmates that will give them lots of love and attention. Something that Andy is no longer capable of. Meet Lotso, the funny leader of Sunnyside. He's welcoming and kind and happy to meet the new guys. However, something in Woody still doesn't feel right. He knows that he belongs to Andy, as do all of them, and he tells them again that Andy still cares about them. They, of course, don't believe him, still convinced they are put in the junk pile. So Woody has no other choice. He says, good. oh, wait a minute. I already said this. Where is that? Hmm. Fun and games. Well, let's look at this. I think I'm on a little journey here. I guess that, that's the midpoint. Okay, fun and games must be the promise of the premise to the people that did the story, Toy Story one. Okay, fun and games. Okay. The acclimation of our character into Sunnyside, there's something new and appealing to this place. Our toys are starting to like it here. It's going to be a lot of fun. That is until the rambunctious playmates return from recess that have one killer session of intense, rowdy, aggressive play. Our toys are thrust around, painted with, smashed against each other, eyes pulled out, ears tweaked. They've never experienced free play like this before. Meanwhile, our B story is home with Bonnie having fun, imaginative play in her yard. She's a caring, kind girl who comes from a loving family, but Woody still misses his real owner. And note, the fun and good games always has the back and forth of the A and B stories as they both propel the plot forward. So the nighttime is setting in Sunnyside, and our characters are fully exhausted after a play session from hell. Buzz and his friends realize that they are not in the age-appropriate childcare rooms, and then they go to ask Lasco if they can move into an older group, as they, they're used to playing with Andy, who is a lot more mature and considerate. However, when they go to find Lasso, they see that he is up to no good. Latsu is an evil character and plans on holding our toys hostage as he's the boss, ruler of Sunnyside. And Mr. Ken Barbie, the guy who Barbie met earlier in the second act, who seemed like only a gentleman, is really Latsu's side and his right-hand man. Latsu and Ken sees Buzz Lightyear and taken to the back where he is reprogrammed and his authentic lovable self is erased. Now Buzz is on Latsu's side. But our other toys don't know this and they get caught up by Latsu and Buzz, locked away like they're in Shawshank Prison. Cut back to our B story. Woody's getting, Woody is getting ready for bed after a day of play when he meets some of Bonnie's other toys. These toys know of Sunnyside, and they warn against the dangers of that place, as well as evil Mr. Lotso, who we come to learn has a backstory that has influenced and created him as a monster. You see, Lotso feels abandoned by his play owner and has this, created this mistrust and sadness that fuels his anger and antagonism. Again, even our bad guy has a storyline that deals with friendship, abandonment, loyalty, etc. Michael Arndt, the screenwriter, is a smart dude who really understands how to tell a focused and clean story thematically. Now, Woody knows his friends aren't safe at Sunnyside. He must return to get them and help them back to Andy before he leaves to college in a day. So, yeah, he's right about that. Toy Story was very well, well written, and the writer knew how to um, write all those character plots and all of the plot points well. Okay, the next number nine that is the midpoint. So we're dependent upon the story. This moment is when everything is great or everything is awful. So there's another reversal here at the midpoint. The main character either gets everything they want or doesn't get what they think they want. But not everything we think we want is what we actually need in the end. So that's the midpoint. Then the bad guys close in. Doubt, jealousy, fear, foes, both physical and emotional, regroup to defeat the main character, the main character's goal, and the main character's great, awful situation disintegrates. So, so at the midpoint, there's another reversal, and then it starts to change back. It starts to reverse again through antagonism. So we see the bad guys close in. That's the antagonism. So 9 and 10. So these beat sheets aren't always exactly like... Um, What's his name's thing? Okay, so the midpoint is the intersection where our A and B stories, Woody comes back to Sunny Crest to rescue his imprisoned friends, and it is now that we are introduced to a ticking clock. 
via Mrs. Potato Head's missing eye that was set up earlier in the story. Her eye was missing and stuck under Andy's bed, and we learned that Andy did not, in fact, want to throw away his toys, but only wanted to put them in the attic pile. And also, there's the ticking clock element where we see, where we all see that Andy is now only a day away from going to college. This new information allows our characters to feel the need and pressure to get out of there now, and it also allows for them to have an emotional closure and realize that Andy still does care about them. Plan, tonight we have to break out of here. The bad guys close in. But it's not going to be easy. Lasso has his men everywhere. He has been wandering, has a wandering baby patrolling outside. He has a trained monkey watching the video screens. The bad guys are looking pretty rough right now. Night comes and the plan, the escape plan begins. Working together, our friends devise a plan to escape through the junk chute. At this, this is the way out of the sunny side. All the while Barbie has a plan of her own, she's distracting Mr. Evilkin, trying to free his brainwashed blood's light year. The plan is going well. Everyone's working together. Despite some glitches, it looks like they're going to make it through the garbage chute when Lasso appears. He's on to them. He's caught them, and they're ne they'll never escape Sunnyside. At that moment, the garbage truck comes and empties the chute, carrying away all of our characters, as well as the evil Mr. Lasso. Number 11, all is lost. Did we go over that yet? No. Okay, so the bad guys close in. Okay, midpoint, bad guys, okay, say 11, all is lost. The opposite moment from the midpoint, awful, great, the moment that the main character realizes they've lost everything they've gained and everything they now have has no meaning. The initial goal now looks even more impossible than before, and here, something or something else, something or someone dies. It can be physical or emotional, but the death of something old makes way for something new to be born. Sometimes it's just their desire that dies or the dream dies. A lot of times that's what it is. The dream dies and um, they have to look at their goal a different way. Then the dark night of the soul. This is a crisis. The main character hits bottom and wallows in hopelessness. The why has now, why has thou forsaken me, Lord, moment. Mourning the loss of what has died, the dream, the goal, the mentor character, the love of your life, etc., but you must fall completely before you can pick yourself back up and try again. Okay, see how they did that in the Toy Story sequence. I'm sorry if this is cumbersome, but I just want you guys to be able to do this. So all is lost. Their plan not only failed, but it looks like they're headed for total disaster in the back of the garbage truck with Mr. Evil Mr. Latzo. And then the Dark Knight of Soul. If things could get any worse, our characters are now taken away to the junkyard and headed right for the junk fire as Lazzo torments and delights in their situation. It's not looking good for anyone at this point. Their goal of getting back to Andy will never be reality, and it looks like Lazzo is going to win. And they are whisked away into the junkyard fire. However, okay. Okay, so we know that at the end of Act 2 is the crisis. So then... Then number 13 is we break into act three. Um, thanks to a fresh idea, a new inspiration, or last minute thematic advice from the B story, sometimes, sometimes a B story, sometimes other, other places, the main character chooses to try again. Then the finale, this time around, the main character incorporates the theme, the nugget of truth that now makes sense to them, into their fight for the goal because they have experience from the A story and context from the B story. Act three is about synthesis. So this is would be the final showdown. <laughs> um, this is breaking into three. Act three is when they get their aha moment and their realization about themselves, as we talked about before. Then the finale is the final showdown. Then the final image, opposite of the open image, pr um, proving visually that change has occurred within the character. Okay, we'll end with Toy Story 3. Brother. Okay. So breaking into Act Three. So breaking into the third act, our characters again rally together and use what they've learned with each other to defeat Dr. Latzlo. Woody tells Latzlo that he has never abandoned, was never abandoned, and that his owner still cares about him. He knows of his story, and he shows him a ribbon that Latzlo's owner used to give him. Lazzo is distracted, and this allows our character to escape. 
Lotsa was taken away by one of the junk truck drivers and appears to be a hood ornament on the truck. Okay. So he foiled Lotso by, by giving him, you know, by dealing with his emotional problems that caused him to be mean to begin with, which was brilliant. So then our finale, our character must get home to Andy before he leaves for college, and they turn and recognize one of the truck drivers that we saw earlier in the movie. He's the guy who listens to his iPod at work and who, who almost took away our characters in the beginning when they were accidentally taken to the garbage pile. Our character knows the garbage guy is on Andy's route, and thus this is their way home. Again, fantastically clean and specifically tight writing from Michael Arndt. Everything is set up and payoff, is a setup and payoff. Everyone returns home to find Andy. Our characters now realize that Andy still cares about them and that they are will be happily in the attic as they will have each other. Woody returns to his chosen spot in the college pile. And everyone else jumps in the attic box. However, there's an emotional beat here with Andy's mother. Again, this perfectly echoes and reiterates our theme. Andy's mother is sad that he's leaving for college. She doesn't want her beloved son to leave, and she's having trouble coming to terms with the separation. I always want to be part of your life, Andy, the mother tells him, trying to choke back tears. This heartfelt and inspirational word changes something in Woody, who jumps from the college pile. Woody knows that he doesn't want to be separated from his other friends and that he must do something quickly to change this. Woody jumps on the attic box and we see him writing something. The final image. It's Bonnie's address that Woody just wrote. And all of our characters still in the box are scooped up by Andy and taken to Bonnie's house, where Woody has already been. And he's seen what a kind young girl Bonnie is. She lives in a loving family, and she will be appreciate them. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're choking up. And she will appreciate them as all his toys. I did that. I cried during the movie. Andy introduces Bonnie to all his toys. They have a play session together. And we know what Bonnie will be in the perfect person to inherit these amazing characters. <laughs> And thus we come a long way from our opening image. We start our movie watching Andy as a young kid, playing with his favorite toys, and now the baton is in past, and we've introduced a new life characters for all our toys. They all get to stay together, and just as Andy's going off to start their life with new friends, our toys will be doing the same. So there we have it. I can't believe I cried at this movie every time. I cried when I watched the movie, and I'm crying when I'm reading the script. But anyway, so um, those 15 points, I gave you a sheet um, for the 15 point beat points that you can do your story and to try to work out the beat points for your story before, even before you get the whole thing writ written down. It'll just be another way to help you organize your story. So that will be the homework for um, next Wednesday, actually, because you have Monday off for a semester break. So that will be due next Wednesday. And what I really, I don't want you to keep writing, doing extra homework, because I want you to start writing your scripts and get going on those. So um, so that will be the last homework. I'm, we're going to be doing a class on how to write um, good characters, but there won't be any homework on that. We'll just hope that you incorporate all that stuff into your script. So anyway, that's all I have for um, today. And so the rest of the day, we can just go over you guys' is, um, scene writing, which I, like I said before, you guys are doing a great job on. And uh, we'll see how everybody else is. It's kind of fun for me, but hopefully you guys enjoy it too. <laughs> I love listening to your stories. So, all right, we'll see you there.